This is an oral history tape made with Mrs. Pamela Farrell Tredinick on the 22nd of May, 1995. Mrs. Tredinick, um, I believe you've been involved with Leonard Cheshire's foundation since the early 60s. Um, what was your first involvement? How did, how did it come about? Well, it came about uh, through my husband, who was a doctor, had been a night fighter pilot during the war and did medicine after the war. and. Uh, he only uh, had done nine months in general practice before he had to give it up because he had multiple sclerosis. And we were searching around and dis investigating all possible avenues of future ways in which he might be able to work, even with the disease, within medicine or in some allied form. He was, he was a doctor? Yes. Yeah. Um, and he'd gone into general practice, but uh, he'd had to give it up. The, the disease deteriorated very quickly, so he was only nine months in practice. And uh, we were left uh, trying to find something that he could do. And uh, my parents were down for the weekend, and we happened to be looking at television on the Sunday night, I think it was, and Leonard Cheshire came on talking about Lee Court. And uh, this must have been 1959, late 1959 or 60, and perhaps early 60. Uh, and my mother said, oh, why don't you ring him up? Might be something you could, you could do with him or for him. And so we rang the BBC. I rang the BBC, and to my amazement, actually got Leonard on the telephone there and then, and he was very nice. And uh, as a result of that, uh, he took Ginger, as we called him, onto, um, into his organization, and he appointed him as welfare officer. And uh, this was wonderful for, for him to have something concrete to do with. And I think he was able to do a, a good job because he was a doctor and a patient. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he wasn't as bad as he became later on. He was able to live at home. And, but he would go around to the various Cheshire homes if they asked him to do so, either for the day, if they were near enough, thought it something that could be dealt with in a day, or for longer periods, staying in the homes, perhaps for two or three weeks helping with problems over mm. administration or um, uh, problems with individual residents. Mm. And, um, and at this stage, how many homes were there? Uh, there would be about... Um, it was expanding rapidly, It was, wasn't it was expanding very rapidly. I should think there were sort of perhaps nine or ten then. Mm -hmm. um, and he was... Uh, I became very interested in them. Uh, I used to take him and fetch him to the homes and... Uh, I became very interested in the work that they were doing and the way in which they were doing it. And each one, although for carrying out the ideals that, uh, that Leonard had laid down, were very different and belonged to the area in which they were situated and they were run by, managed by, paid for by the people in the local area. And uh, I thought they were doing a wonderful job and uh, there was still a great demand for more accommodation because then in those days there was no accommodation for the longer term younger, chronically sick or disabled mm, people other than a geriatric ward, so mm. that if you can imagine how awful it would be. Mm. Well, even at our age, but let alone if you're sort of 18 and you've had a motorcycle accident and you're forced to live 30 or 40 years of life in a geriatric mm. ward and nothing mm. to look forward to and nothing to do. It's, it's I think that's what inspired you, see, what mm. That's one, right. One of that's right. Yeah. That's mm. what got us all going, really. And uh, yeah. there wasn't a Cheshire home in our part of the world. We were still living on the outskirts of Crawley, where in Sussex, where his practice had been. And so, in a, a slightly slap happy mood one day, um, we, um, d d uh, I decided it would be a good idea to start one round there. Mm -hmm. And um, I borrowed a, a site at the local, I, I, they gave me a site at the local freight committee of Whit Monday 1960 in Crawley at the Carnival. And I went round to various other Cheshire homes and borrowed things that they had made, that residents made, and we put them on exhibition there and the children um, helped me do design posters asking people to help us to start a Cheshire home. And uh, my uh, parents came down for the weekend and we all had collecting tins. I had borrowed a tin from the sports outfit to, to house this exhibition of uh, things that had been made um, in exchange for a little notice on the outside saying this tent has been kindly laid yeah. by it's such and such. Yeah, it's sponsoring. <laughs> and um, we, were, we all had collecting tins, mother and father and the two children my sister and myself, and um, it, it poured with rain from the moment after the opening ceremony until long after it closed, and we were the only sideshow with any sort of a roof over it. So we did very well, because people came into shelter from the rain, and they didn't get out without putting something 
in the collecting tins, uh, and so we went home very wet and bedraggled and emptied these collecting tins on the carpet and found we had what seemed the princely sum then of 40 pounds, six shillings and eight. Uh, and then, I mean, we were off, really, although um, I suppose it was, I suppose I hadn't really thought about the difficulties which lay ahead in starting a treasure home. You, no, start no, no, you just get terribly fired up with the enthusiasm to to do something mm -hmm. which is of service to other people in that way where there was a great need and uh, and so I just tried to collect money and I tried to get local people interested in what we were doing. And the local Rotary Club, locally Rotary Club, were very kind and agreed to put on a public meeting for me and Leonard Cheshire came down and spoke for me. It's been a sort of double act, as it were. And uh, I got a local committee, a steering committee. Leonard Cheshire, of course, knew what I was doing and, and uh, encouraged and supported it. And uh, we... Um, by the October of that year, where we'd started on May the 1st, 1960, we'd got nearly a thousand pounds, which was a lot of money then. So um, you must have put on a lot of fundraising projects. Mm, we did all sorts of fundraising things, and um, I, we'd seen a house, I'd been looking at houses all this time, and I found a house which seemed as if it might be suitable on the outskirts of Surrey uh, and Sussex, and um, they wanted ten thousand pounds for it. The whole estate with the cottages and a lot of extra land, which we later on had to buy, it was 12,500, but, but we couldn't afford that since we'd only got a thousand pounds, um, and not quite that. Um, so we decided that they offered us the house and a little bit of ground around it for 10,000 pounds. So I said, yes, well, this would be fine. And um, I managed to talk a building society into giving us a loan of 7,000, and that left us with three. And we'd got a thousand, as I said, and I was desperate by this time to get the other money. I would got till the end of whatever it was, September or something, mm -hmm. to find it and complete the thing. And um, I was really desperate. And I happened to be at a hotel. I was speak. I'd be asked to speak at a, another meeting. Uh, and on the way out, I was waiting in the in the foyer, and there was a man, and it, I, he wasn't with anybody. And I said, I, I went up to him. I said, Excuse me, you you wouldn't like to lend us two thousand pounds, would you? Just yes, and he was very uh, overcome and shocked, and I think <laughs> so surprised that he said yes, and he did, and we were in business, but we didn't have a penny to furnish or equip it, mm. um, and uh, we had to redouble our efforts to raise money and uh, mm. collect law, or, you know, furnishings, anything that was given, or mm. we begged and borrowed, and we didn't steal, but it was only for lack of opportunity, I think, <laughs> not for any other reason, and we were able to open uh, heavily on uh, 11 months. On the 1st of May 1961, the Carnival Committee was the 1st of June, so we were 11 months from the day of first starting it. Okay. We opened it yeah. uh, with 11 residents, and it's grown throughout the years, and we've added bits and pieces to it till it's as it is now, with approximately 30 residents. Mm -hmm. um, and the applications still came in at an alarming rate, and we still couldn't do anything about it. We were only scratching at the surface of the problem, so. I wondered where else we could do something of similar kind, and um, uh, I met a lady who once said to me, if I give you the land at Langton Green, which is just outside Tunbridge Wells, uh, will you come and build a home there? Uh, and the idea seemed suddenly to be the right one. Mm. Um, mm. Actually it wasn't, because she was built on the top of a precipice, and everybody in a wheelchair who'd lost control would have ended up in feet below. Uh, at the bottom of a sort of ravine. Also, she decided that she wanted us to build her a house in the grounds and let her live there rent-free. So the whole thing didn't work, but the place seemed right. And so I started all over again in Tunbridge Wells and got a committee together. It's quite separate from Heatherley. It's a far enough away to appeal to a different section for people. Mm -hmm. For uh, money and support and volunteer help. And did, did you have any problems? You say you, you, you say I formed a committee, as if it was, mm. must have been much more difficult than that sounds. Mm. Um, what do you think was the spark that made people want to be involved? What, what was the spark that made you want to be involved? Was it from Leonard uh, Yes, himself? it was from Leonard himself, but and. and seeing the need which he saw and realising and understanding that and uh, and admiring uh, so much what he was trying to do and realising that this was the answer to this particular need and that there was no other at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think the policy we always, I always uh, had was to try to show people what we wanted to do and why and mm -hmm. ask them to help us 
mm. and through ourselves on their nurses, as it were, mm. and, and they did, mm. in a wonderful way, in most fantastic sort of way. So that Seven Springs at Tunbridge Wells became the second home with which I was involved. And then one night, Len uh, rang me quite late on Saturday night and said that he was uh, going to speak at, the, at Seven Oaks School the next day and that um, he wasn't well, he was in bed with flu and he didn't want to let me down and I, I was scared. And so I went and I was very apprehensive about this. It was at the end of morning service, the whole school was forced to attend and once a month they had famous big people speaking. And they were all expecting Leonard Cheshire to be there. Of course it was simply all from my point of view. Mm. And I remember standing up in this pulpit thing, looking at this down the length of the church, every seat filled with people who didn't want to be there and you and weren't interested in what I was going to say anyway. It was absolutely awful. But um, we, the headmaster, uh, we went all down for coffee into the crypt afterwards and um, as a result of that meeting, people came forward and offered to, uh, da uh, to come forward and help me to get a home going in that area. Mm. And that's when Chipstead Lake eventually uh, came about mm -hmm. from the committee which we formed then. That's the third home you've been mm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, some friends of mine who'd been involved at Heatherley moved down to the Isle of Wight and there wasn't a home there, so we started again all over there and we got up to Cliff. So that was the fourth one in this country that, mm -hmm. that I was involved with setting up. Um, now, just very briefly, one of the things that had struck me as very um, sad was that there was nowhere that any of our people could go to for holidays in an ordinary sort of holiday environment. Um, you know, even if a hotel said that they would take wheelchairs, they usually weren't really at all capable of doing it. And mm. there were steps up or the lifts wouldn't they weren't big enough to take a wheelchair. And a lot of people didn't, um, uh, didn't like um, the fact of having disabled people at the next table, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because of this need that we set up the Farrell Trust in order to uh, uh, to sue, to cater for this, mm -hmm. not only for Cheshire Home residents, but of course largely for them as well, um, but for uh, anybody else. And that has gone on from that day to this. Mm -hmm. But before we actually got on to that, um, there, I, I felt it was very sad that people um, whose husband or wife deteriorated to the extent that they couldn't manage them at home. They had to put them into an institution because they, they, the facilities then uh, for adapting houses, uh, which exist today, did not exist then. And if your house wasn't suitable and your wheelchair wouldn't go through the bedroom door, that was just too bad. Yeah. And this happened to me and eventually I couldn't manage Ginger at home at all and he had to go permanently into a Cheshire home. Uh, and I thought this was really awful and I wanted very much to do something about it. And uh, one day uh, a couple came round Heatherley when I was there and I took them round and showed it to them. They were very interested and I didn't know who they were. I didn't know they were very wealthy, which perhaps just was us just as well because I wasn't trying to catch more than was a bit second nature to me then. Um, and we, went, we ended up at, at, uh, at a big window overlooking a lawn at the side of the house on which we'd had the fate the week before that Leonard Cheshire had come down to open and um, I said one day we shall have bungalows on there we shall have, uh, and they asked us questions and I said we'd have 12 bungalows in a horseshoe shape uh, which would be specially designed for married couples one of whom is disabled mm -hmm. to enable them to stay together it'd be specially designed and also the Cheshire home would be available unobtrusively if required for daycare or in case of emergency, which would enable the fit one to go out to work to earn the money they needed to live on. Oh, but so he thought this was a very good idea, and I went and asked him a question, and he said, have you any idea how much it will cost? Oh, yes, I said, I know exactly how much it will cost. It cost £50,000. £12,000, mind you. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget the look on his face as he turned across to his wife, and then he turned back to me and said, all right, then we'll give it to you. And they did, and he was very amused when they were all finished um, to, to have a, a cheque for £19.54 um, or something as um, change. Change. But the, the, the history of the foundation seems to be peppered with anecdotes like that. Mm. The right people at the right place right. at the right time. Mm. It's all. Yes. It's, yeah. So much of it has really been, uh, you know, really, um, in my life anyway, it's been a succession of miracles. It's no good people saying that, of course, don't happen because mm -hmm. in my life they've been an everyday occurrence. If you look for them, they're there. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, there, there was a slight stack because at that time the constitution of the Leonard Cheshire Foundation only allowed for accommodation for the disabled person, not the able-bodied one. Mm. And so that was why we first of all made the Farrell Trust. Um, to, uh, we did this with the uh, absolute agreement and cooperation of Leonard Cheshire and the Cheshire Foundation. Um, who agreed with what we were trying to do, and they let us have the ground at the side of Heatherley on at the Peppercorn Rent. And we formed the, the trust, um, which was separate altogether, and we built these 12 bungalows. We didn't have the money to furnish and equip them, but they were specially designed, as carefully as we could, to, with every possible gadget. Mm -hmm. And um, there was the problem of how we were going to finish to furnish them. So one of the things we were going to do was to collect green, green shield stamps, because for each million green shield stamps, we could get 5,000 pounds, which we needed, to do each bungalow. And so uh, we had an appeal in the telegraph, in the Daily Telegraph, there was a full page appeal of why Mrs. Farrell, it said at the top, why Mrs. Farrell wants um, millions of green shield stamps, and there was a picture of Leonard and me. And um, we got them, you know, they came in from all over the country, and there was an old man in Chatham, for instance, who sat outside they're one of the big multi-stores each Saturday morning until he got a thousand for each year of his age and he was 80 and he sent us 80,000 and it was so in that way we got mm. enough money to furnish and equip each of them and mm. uh, Princess Alexandra came down with Leonard Cheshire um, to open them and, and it won't matter now because the people involved are all dead but for the first bungalow I mean, the, the, uh, Miss Taylor, I'm going to tell you, it was really very amusing at the time, but the first bungalow was occupied by uh, a couple, he was disabled, and they'd only been married about three weeks, and it was the only one that was occupied, and Princess Alexandra and, and Leonard Cheshire and all the VIPs were all going to go into this bungalow, the people didn't mind, they were very pleased to have them all, and uh, so they were lined up outside, this man and his wife, you see, and. Uh, so I introduced them to the princess and to, to group Captain Cheshire, and so the um, princess said to him, I hear you were just back from honeymoon, you must be very happy. He said, well, it was much better with my first wife, but otherwise it's all right. <laughs> Which was quite confusing at the time. Anyway, I'm sure the princess reacted. <laughs> so that, in fact, I was ahead of myself because we built these 12 bungalows there, then we found that there was a great demand for families rather than just married couples. Mm -hmm. So we went on and leased the land at the back of Seven Springs and we built six houses. Well, four houses and two bungalows, but they are uh, large enough for families with children. And they've been occupied ever since by families, one of whom is disabled, either the child or the parents. Uh, and uh, they, they have worked very well. And it was because there was nowhere for these people to go on holiday that we, we didn't do any more housing developments, but we went, went into the holiday field. Mm -hmm. Which you, you still run, don't you? Yes, so, yes yeah. we do. But uh, yes, we've got 17 holiday properties of various sorts in various parts of the country and we run that from home. Mm. Um, wasn't there, just digressing a moment, wasn't there a, a possibility of using a hotel called Holgate's on, in the Silly Isles for um, a holiday home for residents at one stage? Yes, there was, but that didn't, uh, that didn't seem to, to come to anything. That wasn't to do with the Farrell Trust, it was something that the foundation, foundation was looking yeah. into. Um, until Park House came along, there wasn't any suggestion, really, although they had thought about it. There were suggestions of the possibility of running holiday accommodation, but it was really so diverse from that which we were actually set up to do mm -hmm. that it was felt that we shouldn't um, go into that. Right. It was only really because uh, when Park House came along that it seemed that the best use to use that property for because of its unique setting and mm. antecedents rather mm. than making it into an ordinary mm. Cheshire home. But special about it. Yes, mm. but that was a development really on its own. Mm. Um, mm. It's been very successful and uh, maybe there will be others, I don't know. Mm. Although the, um, the uh, demand has, has changed so much since the uh, New Care and the Community Act and uh, care is coming more and more uh, community-based rather than residential homes. Mm. Uh, I personally think that there will always be a, a need for residential homes in more or less the same sort of way uh, because I think that um, of course people become very disabled to the stage where it's a nightmare trying to live on their own even with backup support but also 
and they can be very lonely and isolated in a community, perhaps on a council estate or something where everybody's out mm. at work or at school and nobody cares, that, you know, about mm. them and there's nothing and to do. The treasure homes have always been designed to be homes in the true sense. That's the right, and, uh, and, and we, in, in, uh, we uh, try to uh, make available uh, every facility for them that if they want to do anything, I mean, a lot of our residents go out to uh, uh, further education, some take degrees, mm. and if anybody wants to do anything, however disabled, you can help them to do it through a Cheshire home so mm. that they live positively with a lot of choice over what they do. Mm. Uh, anyway, the two things um, in the Cheshire Foundation has developed or is developing very much in the field of community care and respite care and care at home in all sorts of different and exciting mm. new ways. But I think there must always be room for a, a wide spectrum of mm. choice to the disabled because individual. Because the demand will always be there. I'm afraid so. Apart from some. Oh, I'm sure. Could we um, move abroad mm. now? Um, I believe you were involved certainly in Canada. How did that come about and when, when was that? Leonard Cheshire had been in the Air Force with a chap called Ernie and he um, was a lawyer in, uh, in Toronto and the, a member of the Rotary Club and every year they came over to, he used to come over for reunions of 617 Squadron and um, every year he used to say to, uh, to Leonard, you know, there's nothing in Canada, please come over and see what you can do. Mm -hmm. And he'd never managed to get there and he got rather um, fed up with this chap, he'd been asking him, so one day he said, you can go and stay. So um, I, I didn't like this because as you said earlier on, it's a very sophisticated and advanced country, much more so than we are in many, many ways. I would have thought so. And that to me it seemed like the greatest impertinence to suggest that I should go into Canada and say, you're not doing something right, you should do this. And I didn't want to go at all and I tried to get out of it, but oh no, he was adamant. And so I was due to go and Ernie Finlay was sort of going to arrange for me to have an introduction to the Rotary Club and things like that. And that was, and then I thought I would try to see what contacts I could get to the, in this country. So I found a man who was a Canadian businessman based in a firm in London, uh, just off the Strand. And he uh, agreed, I'd been given his name, and after I'll go and see him, I thought, well, I might be able to get some contact. You see, tell me, give me his advice. So I went, uh, and it wasn't a very nice day, and he wasn't a very nice man, I do. <laughs> and and uh, he said exactly what I thought, that it was impertinent of me to consider going, and that there was a wonderful system called the Red Feather, which it is. The, the Red Feather is a symbol in Canada, um, of um, an organisation called Medicare, which is a thing which is, um, it looks after all Canadian long-term sick and disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that there was this wonderful organisation and it was far superior to anything in, in this country and what the hell did I think I was doing? And that was that. So I went away and he wouldn't give me any names and he wasn't at all. He felt just the same as I did. And so I went out and I was rather upset because it was still pouring with rain and I went back to the station, uh, Charing Cross station I was going to, and um, I was on a day ticket, cheap day ticket, and I couldn't travel between half past four and six or something. And I'd just missed the train and I got there at about a quarter to five and I didn't, I didn't want to pay the extra to transfer my, and so I, and I didn't know what to do quite. And then I felt it was a hand in the small of my back and I found myself being propelled through the swing doors of the Charing Cross Hotel. And I'd never done anything like that before. And, and, and you know, it's not the sort of thing in those days, at any rate, I didn't think of going into hotels in London by myself. I mean, you know, it wasn't mm. something that entered my mind particularly. But there I was into the foyer of this hotel and it looked just like a Cheshire home. It was full of wheelchairs. And I thought perhaps I was hallucinating or something. Anyway, I said to one of the people in the wheelchairs, and they were unpacking, and they would come off, they'd come off a big coach, they were just unpacking, and I said, oh, excuse me, but are you, uh, can you tell me where, where you're from, and what you're doing? And so it appeared that they were on a three-week tour, of, they were Americans, they were on a three-week tour of uh, Europe, and they'd done a week in Paris, and they were doing a week in London, and they just tried to do their week in London. And they were in varying stages of disability, none of them frightfully bad, but all of them, most of them in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, oh, are you all from the States? Yes, she said. No one from Canada, said I. No, no. Whereupon someone down, a bit few chairs along, said, oh, yes, there's Doris. Doris is from Toronto. So 
So I said, well, could you tell me where Doris is? So she, they said, oh, yes, well, she's gone down. She's gone up to her room. She's just gone down the passageway now. She's falling in the lift. So I chased after this. Got into the lift with this rather a fat lady in a wheelchair, her helper. And I said, excuse me, are you Doris? And she said, yes. I said, well, you think I'm quite mad, but you're disabled and you live in Toronto. And have you everything you want? Is everything all right for you? Is it hunky-dory, as it were? So she said, no. Uh, everything I want. She said, I live in an upstairs flat and my wheelchair won't go through the door and I haven't been out for five years. This is the first time I've been out and people had to carry me through the flat and downstairs. I never go out to the shops. I can't do anything. I'm entirely alone. So um, I, she was very tired and it was an awful imposition. And I said, well, look, I want to come over and see if there's anything we can do to help people like you. Um, what would you suggest? I, where would I start? So she said, well, she gave me the name of a woman called Mary Hodge who lived in Toronto. And she said, she is the sort of lady in charge of uh, chronically disabled people uh, and their sort of welfare work. And she said, if you, when you get to Toronto, if you ring her, she will help you and uh, suggest people that you might approach. Mm -hmm. Well, so then I went quite soon after that to Toronto. Another, uh, another miracle. Yes, well, uh, and I was still terribly diffident about all this. Mm -hmm. and. I had got a bed and breakfast room the first night. I didn't know a single soul apart from Mary Hodge, and I hadn't contacted her before I got there. This was the woman's name. And I'd, I'd booked a room um, from the, somebody who had given me the name of this pe these people that took in bed and breakfast people. And it was a place called Hamilton, where the airport's at Hamilton. And in my case, I thought this was mm -hmm. not the same at all. Hamilton town is about 40 miles away from the airport. But anyway, um, they had agreed to give me a room for one or two nights and I was going to take it from there. Well, they very kindly came to fetch me. And when I got to this house, I found that um, there were two young uh, sons and a daughter. And um, the daughter had moved out of her room to give it to me and was sleeping in a sleeping bag in her mother and father's room. And so they'd given me this room. And I went in there very tired, very... Um, disheartened and afraid and apprehensive and everything else, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, and there on the, on the oh, dressing table in this room was a pink elephant. Uh, and it was dressed in a pink ballet on one shoe, pink ballet skirt, and big eyelid lashes like this. And I'd seen one exactly like it before. And I picked it up and underneath its foot, it, it was stitched, it said, sold in aid of Heatherly Cheshire Home England. To believe yeah. it. I thought, well, it's not up to me to be frightened. Oh, that is amazing. It is amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. But you see what I mean? It's just everyday occurrence. Yes. Anyway, I um, I then rang up Mary Hodge the next morning, and I said, I've just come out from England, and you're very involved with the field of disablement. Could, could, I, could I come and see you? I, I told her roughly what I wanted about. So she said, well, the best thing for you to do is to go down as a a conference uh, of all people working in disablement in Ontario at Niagara this weekend. And if you go there, you will find everybody working in the field of disablement together, and you'll be able to collect all the statistics about the number of cases and what provision there is and everything else that you could possibly want. You have to go tomorrow, Friday. So I just got on a bus and I went to Niagara. And there I, got, I went to this conference, and there I met a fantastic woman called Marg McLeod. And she um, became very involved, and um, she and I worked the rest of the time I was there to collect people together again, try to set up a steering committee. In my ignorance of what was to come, really, I made a big basic mistake uh, in that um, I set up a, a Cheshire Foundation. Um, because what, if you go to a foreign country, you, uh, you set it up in that country when it is legally. Um, um, set up in that country uh, so that the country, you know, plods its own canoe. Once mm. it's set up, we don't at attempt to run it at all. We mm. try to uh, set up the organization and mm -hmm. then each country must take their own responsibility for it. And in my ignorance, really, I set up the Cheshire Foundation of Canada, Incorporated. Uh, and of course, it, it's led to some a certain amount of trouble, which I didn't realize at the time, because what I should have done is to have made it the Cheshire, Cheshire Foundation of Ontario Incorporated, not mm -hmm. Canada, mm -hmm. because there's been a lot of uh, uh, difficulty about some of the other provinces mm -hmm. wanting to come under that umbrella, because it was based basically in Ontario. But anyway, that's a, mm -hmm. a technical detail. Anyway, uh, Marg and I got 
terribly um, swept up on a sort of um, a whirl of excitement and one person led to another and we got a committee going and we set up the organisation uh, and that has been a miraculous success in Toronto. There are now some 37 homes in and around Toronto and many more coming up all the time and they're very exciting, they're very, they've been very forward looking. Um, they've got all different sorts of accommodation which in many cases we don't have here and for instance they've also got um, contracts with all the um, uh, transport that they can have free transport on specially designed buses for wheelchairs and things like that mm -hmm. which we don't do here they have a marvelous taxi service which is available to the disabled um, as readily as ordinary taxi mm -hmm. service and all these sort of mm -hmm. things have come very f very far-reaching we've got some homes for university students who are disabled and some which take a floor or an apartment in an apartment block Mm. Um, with all the facilities, some which don't have attendants but run their own mm. thing, uh, you know. So that there was a need? Of course there was a need, an, an mm. amazing, overwhelming need. Mm. There was nothing except a geriatric ward at all, mm. whatever that man said. Mm. So that was terrific. Well, um, and then one day he asked me if I would go to Guyana. Is this Leonard? Yeah. Yes, I was to go to Guyana, this was my next trip. Um, Guyana, uh, again, uh, there was an ex-RAF man living there and said it was there, said it was there for Guyana, there was nothing there. So off I went this time and he said, oh, by the way, um, you can get a, a, a flight which enables you to have a, a stopover on the way there and on the way back at the same price. So he stopped and said, you can decide where you'd like to go and see what's cooking there. And so um, I looked at the map um, Oh, so I was to call in at Jamaica, that's right, I, had a, I was to call in at Jamaica because there'd been a movement to have a, a home in Jamaica which had not come to anything. And on the way back I could choose where I went. And so on the way back I had looked at the map, or I'd discovered that uh, Barbados was one of the most densely populated areas in, the, in that part of the world. And um, so I thought, well, that's one of the stops, so I would stop there. And um, mm -hmm. in Jamaica we eventually got the Cheshire Village going. Um, which is um, integrated housing, mm -hmm. yes, which we started as a result of that visit. Mm -hmm. We've got the Thelma Vaughan Home for Children going in Guyana at a place called Mahaika, which used to be a leper colony just outside uh, Georgetown, and that's been going ever since, and it's very successful. Well, then I was coming back, uh, rather sort of tired and, uh, again, rather dispirited, because here again I'd, I had no contact at all in Barbados and nobody had written to them and said it would be a good idea or anything else. I didn't even have a, one foot in the door uh, and I'd booked in somewhere for about five days or something and um, I got off the aeroplane very hot, rather tired and wondering what the hell to do next and uh, I was last I think off the aeroplane and a woman came up to me and she said, excuse me, um, where have you come from? So I said, where I come? She said, oh are you from England? I said, yes. So she said, well would you mind coming with me because we had a, there was a VIP, an English VIP that was supposed to come off that airplane who hadn't got on it. But the reception committee was all waiting for this English VIP and would I go instead because they had nobody else. So of course I went in front, straight in front of the television cameras at uh, Barbados Airport uh, and I had the most wonderful quarter of an hour I could possibly ever have had. Mm. And I had a, one, an absolutely fantastic time in those six days. Within those six days, the government had given me a piece of land, an ar architect had drawn up plans. I had lunch with the High Commissioner just before I went on the plane and they'd given us planning permission. All within six days, five days or something, just because whoever it was that was supposed to go didn't get there. You see what I mean? Yes, yes. yes. So that was that. So that's the film of Warn uh, Home for Children in Barbados, which has gone... Mm -hmm. on ever since. And this was, was still the 60s? Oh no, no, that's much later, 19, yeah, mm -hmm. 1970s. Mm. Um, what about turning more to perhaps Leonard Joshua himself? What, mm. Give me your impressions of him as a, as, as a person. Um, well, he was a remarkable, a remarkable man. He was very, um, a, a very laid back, very quiet, um, and very, um, rather aesthetic looking, very, uh, really very thin and rather gaunt looking at any rate in the later years because I think he'd got this funny tropical disease which he picked up somewhere and he didn't, he didn't really, couldn't get much nourishment from his food so he was very thin anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but he had the most tremendous sort of 
inspiration, I suppose, and spirit, and, uh, and a tremendous sense of humor, which was not always obvious, because it was very deadpan. Yes, and, I yes, mm. and you were, unless you knew him very well, you wouldn't always realize that he was, in fact, being very funny. And uh, when you did know him very well, you, you know, you could appreciate this a little bit more, I think. Mm -hmm. He had a genius, I think, for inspiring people with his, uh, it, because he believed in it so much, I think, yeah. that he, he was able to do that. Mm -hmm. He was also a very um, perceptive man. I, mean, I, I was with him once when he was talking to somebody who was very disabled, and he sort of said, well, uh, he'd asked him how he was, and I can't remember what the conversation, how it had come, but I always remember him saying, well, if you can't do anything about it, then you've got to make the best of what you've got, rather. I mean, he, that sounds awful. He wasn't preaching all mm. but I mean, he was sympathizing with his man to say, well, mm. you know, if there's nothing you can do about it, it's no good worrying about it in a way. Mm. It's no good worrying about it if you can't mm. do anything about it. Mm. Um, I don't know. Uh, it he, also, well, he also believed in making the best of what you've got. Yes, that's what I mean. Yes, see, if, yeah. if you can't alter something, then you've, yes. got to, you've got to accept that there are mm. things there. Um, when he was very ill, uh, and he was very ill, I mean, motor neurone disease is, an, is an horrific disease, I think. It's even worse than multiple sclerosis. It's much more sort of inexorable. It just, there is no future, and, and, and it's a horrendous thing. And it was, it was ironic and very, very sad in a way that he should be reduced to the same state, or worse, than most of the people he didn't done so much to help all his life. I mean, mm. it would have seemed much kinder had he sort of fallen under a bus or had a heart attack or something. But to go through this, that he'd spent his whole life trying to help, seemed to me to be terribly sad and, and ironic. But, of course, he didn't feel that. He mm. felt that he was, it was a privilege that he was able to really to understand what they were having to go through mm. and that he felt it was a privilege that he'd been selected in this way but I don't think that, I mean, that's an almost saintly, isn't it? It is, yes, yeah. yeah. I met a woman the other day who, um, funny enough, he, he used to spend a lot of his weekends down at Laundry Cottage which used to belong to his father at Lee Court and I met a woman only on the Friday of last week actually who was Roman Catholic and she said that almost every week well, all, every week when he was down there, which was quite a lot apparently. I didn't know that, but apparently he went down there a tremendous number of weekends. And he always went to this church, and she always sat as near as she could to him because she felt he was so saintly that some of it might rub off onto her. And she said he was totally wrapped up, alone with his God in the service, and it was almost as if there was an aura around him. Mm. Uh, mm. A, 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 mm. Dedication and... Uh, Do you think he had a, if he had not had his faith, he would still have done the work he did? Well, something very much changed him, didn't it? Because, I mean, he had been such a playboy and anything but mm -hmm. uh, the way he was afterwards. I would, I would say no, and I think one of the things that really had a tremendous bearing on it was his going to the dropping of the atom bomb. Mm -hmm. I think that experience so, uh, so shook him mm -hmm. that he decided then that he wanted to spend the rest of his life on trying to alleviate human suffering instead of causing it. Mm -hmm. Just one last thought, it's almost exactly three years, not quite, since his death. Do you think the Foundation in the last three years has taken uh, the road that he would have liked it to have done? And do you think it has suffered from his death, apart from the obvious of his presence? Suffered from his death very much, of course, as you say, the obvious lack. Mm -hmm. I, I think his, his, his idealism and his leadership is an immeasurable loss. And I think this is one of the big problems that's been facing the Foundation ever since he died, is how to maintain that spirit without his leadership. It's not very easy, and it's going to become more and more difficult as time goes by, and his name slips out of the sort mm. of public knowledge more and more. And that's why I think we've got to concentrate on, on keeping this spirit alive, and we mustn't lose sight of it. We must not become too commercialized or or too intent on running an efficient organization that we lose sight of this idealism and wonderful god-given inspiration um it's difficult to say whether he would have been pleased uh, I, I think overall he probably would 
the organization of the headquarters has been altered, as you know, because they have now divided up, decentralized a lot of the work which was done at Monster Street as the work's become more and more uh, big, bigger and bigger and more varied and dissipated into the different sections of care at home and respite care and day care, all these things. Um, there was so much that it couldn't possibly be dealt with in Monster Street uh, by the, that organization. I think it would either have had to have moved out somewhere altogether and had an enormous increase in staff and accommodation mm. to cover the thing nationwide or do what it was decided to do and I still think this was the right decision to divide the country up into three areas north south and west um, to um, to uh, supervise and administer their own counties mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is working well now I think it had some probably a teasing um, teething troubles mm -hmm. to start with because some of the homes felt that they were trying to impose another layer of bureaucracy on them because they didn't realize the difficulties but uh, I think it is it is working mm -hmm. well now and of course we are in an increasingly competitive world and um, in the field of disablement as well as everything else there are a lot of uh, private nursing homes and private firms and things mm -hmm. trying to um, do the same sort of job and if we are to exist at all we've got to be competitive we've got to be efficient and uh, and well run and because of this we need more and more professionals mm. nowadays than we did in the early days and then um, this is inevitable I'm afraid and yet keeping the balance would be of like course the idealism of course but I do think that he would have been pleased with all the different developments these new forward-looking ways in which we are going forward into the unknown to all try to satisfy as well as the existing need, which I think will always exist, uh, other needs as and when they come up and uh, um, care in the community is very much one of them mm -hmm. and respite care and care now we have a system that St Bridget's who's rather the forerunner in this where they will um, not only um, go to look after um, people living in the community on a, a sort of daily basis or out of hours basis or whatever mm -hmm. but now they will move in and live with a disabled person to enable a carer to go on holiday mm -hmm. which they haven't had for many years and this is far-sighted and it would be entirely uh, in accordance with the way that Leonard would like to have looked at it I feel sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's just one thing I'd like to finish off with if I may in the very early days of my working with Leonard and I worked with him very closely for over 30 years. Um, I read a piece of poetry that had been written by a prisoner of war in a Japanese prison camp just before he died. And his sufferings must have been immeasurable. Uh, but he had written, um, I sought my soul, but my soul I could not see. I sought my God, I sought my, I sought my God, but my God eluded me. But I sought my brother and I found all three. And I thought that was a wonderful piece of poetry for somebody in those circumstances to write. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed with this and uh, I made sure that we had it up in, the, uh, in each of the homes which I started, both in this country and overseas. Mm -hmm. As far as I was concerned, it, it was very true. Pamela Farrell, thank you very much.